last last Saturday was uh, a wonderful a wonderful day from from our end. Um, we had the, the march down here. Um, the police uh, were here in numbers, um, and we presented a list of demands to Superintendent Powers, and we asked we gave them uh, seven days to respond to those demands. We demanded that the, uh, the police officer who was responsible for the for the taser attack on our sister that uh, caused her to lose her sight be identified. Um, we asked for that police officer to be suspended because we regard, we regard him as, uh, as number one. He committed a criminal criminal assault upon a sister of ours that caused her now to have a permanent disability. So he has. Uh, committed an action that uh, should surely be charged with assault and occasion grievous bodily harm. That, that has to happen. Also ask that uh, because of what of this incident that uh, all police in the Logan area should immediately suspend use of the taser weapon. We also ask that uh, there be an immediate and urgent inquiry into the incident and that inquiry uh, should be headed up by senior people as well. It should be an Aboriginal elder and a Torres Strait Islander elder on that inquiry panel. We have no confidence in, in cops, investigating cops. That went on for so many years and we had so many situations where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people suffered at the hands of Queensland Police. We had hundreds of situations where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were bashed, raped, murdered in police custody. And the only persons who could have committed those offences were wearing the blue uniform. And each time we took these matters up, we just had cops investigating cops, and they'd come back to us and they'd say, "Sorry, we couldn't find any evidence of any wrongdoing by any police officer." And Shame, that's, just, that's just bullshit. That's just bullshit. Shame. Shame. In recent times, 1993, we had a situation with Daniel Yock, Daniel Alfred Lock, Yock, murdered by Queensland cops on November 7th, 1993. The matter was referred to the CJC at the time. An agent of the CJC about three months come back and they made a complete finding that no police officer had any case to answer. And yet there were witnesses, Aboriginal witnesses and white witnesses who saw these cops smash young Daniel into the concrete saw him carried almost lifeless and unconscious into the paddy wagon. Within a very short time, he was dead. Daniel Yock, 1993. We all know the situation with, with Mulrunji Dumbaji, 2004, Palm Island. Bashed to death on the floor of the Queensland, of the Palm Island Watch House. The only persons that were inside the Watch House at that time were Mr Dumbaji and other cops. Senior Sergeant Chris Hurley bashed Cameron Dumaji to death. And we mobilised around, around Daniel Yott's case, around Cam Cameron Dumaji's case. We mobilised as a community and each time we have asked for an independent inquiry into these situations because we know that there's overwhelming evidence that the police involved in these incidents did the wrong thing. But here we are, in 2014, 2014. Queensland has been a state for 155 years. Queensland has been a legal political entity for 155 years, yet right across that entire span of 155 years, there's never been a single cop or correctional services officer ever found guilty, responsible or accountable for an injury to an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander person in their custody. And that is, that is bullshit. That is, that is wrong. We will all know, we all know of incidents. Many of us have family members who have suffered in the watch houses, suffered on the streets from police assaults, Many of us have rallies inside the correctional services prisons who again have suffered serious assaults at the hands of 
as correctional service officers. But to this day, we have not had one case, one instance, where a cop or a prison officer has ever been called to account for an action that caused harm or injury to an average Torres Strait Islander prisoner. That defies belief. And here we have a, a situation where an Aboriginal woman was attacked in her own home. Her testimony and the evidence of witnesses is, is absolutely compelling. That uh, Sheila Oakley, at the time that she was hit by this taser weapon, at the time she was no threat to the police who were there, there's no threat to any other member of the public, there's no threat to herself. This, this cop who fired this taser weapon into her face, hit her in the face and hit her in the, in the shoulder, he is supposed to be a registered instructor in the use of a taser weapon. And yet, he used his taste weapon when Sheila Oakley was obeying his directions. He discharged his weapon, it hit her in the eye, hit her in the shoulder. She's now lost the sight in that eye. For, for what? And she wasn't even in custody. This is one of the most bizarre, more, more bizarre, more bizarre aspects of, of what happened down there at the house because when I was first told about this, I expected Sheila Oakley to be in the bed, but in handcuffs. I thought if they'd used the taste of weapon, that she must have been in custody. She must have been arrested and charged with some sort of offence. But apparently she was carried bodily from, from the veranda and placed into the ambulance. She wasn't under any strain. She went to the hospital. She was uh, rushed into, into uh, treatment. And right through the course of that, uh, she was not in custody. So on what, on what grounds, on what basis did this, did this cop use the taser weapon? She was not resisting. He'd asked her to go, come to the station here for, for a further conversation. She was happy to do that. She just reached out for her, her purse at that point, this cop fired this taste weapon, hit her in the eye, hit her on the shoulder. But she wasn't in custody. So, so what the Queensland cops are saying to us is that uh, any one of us who comes into contact with any police officer in the state of Queensland faces the same sort of danger, same sort of threat. Catherine and I went to a, uh, a refugee rally last night in King George Square, and there would have been about... Uh, what, three, four hundred people in the square protesting about refugees. None of us had any weapons, none of us uh, were going to throw firebombs or anything like this. It was, people were very angry, very passionate about what they're doing, but again, we pose no threat to anyone else in the area, pose no threat to the police. Yet again, these cops come along with their huge Glock pistols and their taser guns. So, Enormous overreaction. Okay, we, we live in a society in which police officers may at times be called upon to defend themselves from violent armed um, criminals. That that that's another matter. That's that's happening at another level. It, we cannot we, we would stretch matters a long, long way to say the police who were at Sheila Oakley's house on that day were under any form of threat. And Sheila Oakley certainly is not a, a violent criminal person who police should fear. I mean, she's a, a smallish woman. I've spoken to a number of people around the community. They all regard her as being a passive, harmless person who is always ready to, to talk to you. Uh, very friendly, very approachable. So it, it, there are a number of issues that these police who were there at that day have to answer. And they're not going to answer by themselves. They're not going to be held accountable by themselves. We can't sit back and let these cops conduct their internal little investigation behind closed doors That's right. and come back in three to five years and say, look, sorry, but uh, none of our officers who are at the scene on that day uh, did anything wrong. So just 
Move on with it. Get on with it. We, we can't allow that to happen. Because last Saturday, a number of speakers said that unless we respond to this in a strong, powerful way, then number one, Sheila Oakley is not going to get the justice she so richly deserves. Number two, the cop who caused her this permanent injury is going to escape any form of punishment. And number three, anyone in the community faces the same sort of threat from any cop who's wearing a taser weapon. And that, that cannot be allowed to happen. That must not be allowed to happen. So we're going to go down here shortly. We're going to front this bulb. We go to seven days to respond to our, our list of demands from the community. Sheila Oakley herself. The, the courage of this woman is, is hard to comprehend because then, in a, even last Saturday, she was still in a great deal of pain. As she walked, she led the march in, uh, in searing heat, um, led the march to here, had the courage because when she was in the PA hospital, she just came downstairs on that one, one day just to have a, a smoke. A police vehicle, police car, Mark police car, came into the hospital grounds on other business. But because as soon as she saw the police vehicle and the uniforms, it caused her a panic attack. And she had to run back into the hospital. She was able to overcome that panic attack last Saturday. And like I said, it took such an incredible degree of courage for her to come down here again. And there's about 50 odd cops here, all are under the teeth. And she walked straight up to them with her brothers and handed them the petitions that had been signed last week. So this woman is, is a woman who needs our support as a broader family, as a community. This woman deserves our support. And the cop who did this to her deserves to be number one exposed. He can't hide behind some blue, thin blue line. He needs to be named. He needs to be suspended. This is a dangerous person. We need to get him off the streets. How can we feel safe? How can we let our children on the streets while you have this cop out there who is probably still wearing a taser weapon? So he's got to be named. He's got to be suspended and he must face criminal charges. If you look at the law books, and you look at the definition of assault, and look at the definition of assault occasion bodily harm, every element of those charges can readily be supported by this incident up here. If he wasn't wearing that blue uniform, he would be in the watch house and he'd be going through the court system. He must be charged. Yep. There is no, there is no backing down on this. So we need to keep, we need to maintain this campaign. We need to go down here and front this bolt until they're going to say to us, eventually, because there'll be other speakers. And then if we aren't satisfied with the responses, then we, we take to the next level. Yep. And we've done this time after time after time. But we can't be frustrated by that because what the conservative politicians, what the ruling class and what the cops are hoping to do is one day they'll, they'll commit an action like this and nobody's going to say boo. Nobody's going to rally, protest, march, demand justice. What the cops are going to hope is that this will all go away very quickly. Well, it's not going to go away. Sheila Oakley is going to have to live for the rest of her life with the loss of an eye. She does not deserve that. The person, the cop who caused her to lose her eye must be held to criminal account. And not, not in five years, not in ten years. We now. want this to happen now. This cop has to be suspended now. Yep. This cop must be charged now. Yep. This cop must go through the court now. Yep. And the only way that's going to happen is not by sitting back and letting this mob do their paperwork and their air conditioned officers, but it'll have to be because we as a community 
and I can't accept their bullshit. Last week we are told that uh, this trouble's all being set up by outsiders. And that, that's, uh, that's a little bit ridiculous because remember, back in the day, back in uh, 2007, we, we finally got Senior Sergeant Chris Hurley charged with manslaughter over the murder of Cameron Dumagee on Palm Island. Every single cop, that's 2007, every single cop in Queensland attended a union meeting in the area and passed a vote of no confidence in their police minister. Because they are so outraged by the fact that one of their mates was being charged for killing a black fox. Shame. Here in Brisbane, they had the, the mass meeting at the Broncos League Club. And the police minister at the time, Judy Spence, even attended that meeting and she even voted to support that motion. So every single cop in Queensland voted to support their mate on Palm Island. But they're not outsiders, no, because they're wearing the blue uniform. They're, they're, they have every right to support their mate on Palm Island. When this situation happens here, you're going to have Aboriginal trust on the people from right across the country. They're going to come here to support our sister and her family and this community. We've got people who drove up here from the Tweed today to be here to be with us. We've got people right across the Greater Brisbane area who have come here to take a stand for our sister. And we will continue to, be, to come here, we'll continue to demand justice for our sister, and we will not stop until that cop is charged one time. Yep. Thank you.